Hello, hello, hello. It's been a while since I posted a video here, but it feels great to be back and doing what I love to do the most. Just know that when you're on a journey to achieve a certain goal in life, sometimes you may have pauses because of, you know, things come up in life, but you never give up, right? You come back and you keep pushing. Um, anyways, in this video, I'll provide you with an introduction and background story to antipsychotics. This video is meant to give you an understanding of how the use of antipsychotics came about. This is a series of videos where I will also cover antipsychotics and the different generations in the next videos, but this one is more of like an introduction. So I hope you enjoy. By definition, antipsychotics refer to drugs that we use to treat psychotic disorders. A psychotic disorder is a disease that affects the brain, causing a person to lose touch with reality and have abnormal perceptions and thinking. This is sometimes referred to as psychosis and is seen in the following disease states. Schizophrenia, the more common one, but it may also be seen in bipolar disorder, depression, and paranoid personality disorder. These patients may present with the following symptoms hallucinations, so seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting or smelling things that aren't there, delusions, believing things that are untrue, such as someone trying to harm you, disorganized thinking or speaking, so the speech may be fast or constant, or the person may switch topic mid-sentence. These are also known as positive symptoms. The term positive refers to the presence of symptoms rather than their absence. It doesn't mean that the symptoms are good or bad. They add on to what would be considered normal experiences. These patients may also experience what we call negative symptoms. It's called negative because they refer to a loss or absence of normal behaviors. Examples include anhedonia, the person may not seem to enjoy all the things that they used to enjoy anymore. A sociality, this symptom can include a lack of social drive or an increased desire to spend time alone. It can also make it difficult to socialize with others or to even hold down a job. Avolition. This symptom can make it difficult to initiate or persist in purposeful activities, such as eating, showering, paying bills, or buying groceries. And lastly, not listed here, but disorganized behavior, like acting in a childlike manner, making inappropriate facial expressions, or certain repetitive movements. As you can see, these patients present with a complex set of signs and symptoms. The cause of this was never well understood on the cellular level prior to the 1950s. Prior to the 1950s, patients with psychosis were hospitalized long-term at crowded mental institutions because of the lack of effective treatments. The serendipitous discovery of the first effect effective antipsychotic agent in the early 1950s sparked considerable interest in the pathophysiology of psychosis. It all began with a French surgeon named Henry Labourette. He was experimenting with various substances in an attempt to develop a new therapy for surgical shock symptoms and in injured soldiers. These symptoms included rapid heartbeat, difficulty breathing, etc. A few experts at that time believed that surgical shock occurred due to the excess reaction to stress from the body's nervous system. The goal thus for Henry was to find an agent or a compound that would reduce the activity of the nervous system before surgery. One of the compounds he experimented with was chlorpromazine. Chlorpromazine was able to induce a state of sedation without patients feeling unconscious. These patients also didn't seem anxious about their upcoming surgery, and these patients woke up in a remarkably calm and stable state. He was so struck by the effect on his patients and noticed its benefits in using this drug to treat psych disorders. He began spreading the news and other psychiatrists throughout France used it on their patients and saw dramatic improvements in the clinical picture. Clopromazine eventually became the prototype drug and first antipsychotic for the management of psychosis. This discovery also sparked considerable interest in the pathophysiology of psychosis. This led to the earliest formulation of the dopamine hypothesis of psychosis, which explains why dopamine is the main culprit in the pathophysiology of psychosis. But before we cover that, let's learn a few things about dopamine. 
So first, dopamine is a neurotransmitter. And neurotransmitters are the body's chemical messengers. They carry messages from one nerve cell to another nerve cell or a target cell, which will then lead to some kind of function. It's produced in different parts of the brain. So the substantia nigra, ventral, tegmental area, or VTA, and not listed here, but also the hypothalamus of the brain. Dopamine plays multiple roles in the brain. It's involved in all of these. So motivation. The levels affect motivation and excitement about things. Low dopamine levels can make it difficult to leave bed or eat and can lead to feelings of tiredness and lethargy. Dopamine is very important for decision making. So dopamine levels affect how people decide whether a goal is worth the effort. People with higher dopamine levels are more likely to focus on the benefits of a task and choose it, even if it's difficult. Next, habit formation. Dopamine signals that something important has happened, which can lead to changes in neural connectivity that make it easier to repeat that activity. This can lead to formation of habits. Dopamine is a part of the brain's reward system, which is designed to reward people with a pleasurable feeling when they do things like eat, have sexual intercourse, or even during social interactions. This reward system will Will tell the brain to pay attention to the experience so it can be repeated in the future. And it also encourages the person to repeat the behavior that led to the reward. Addiction. Drugs produce large surges of dopamine, which can reinforce the connection between the drug, the resultant pleasure, and external cues linked to the experience. This can lead to uncontrollable cravings, even when the drug isn't available. Voluntary movement. Dopamine regulates movements and imbalances in the level, like we see in Parkinson's disease, where there's a decrease in the dopamine in certain parts of the brain. It's usually released from areas where it's produced and then it travels to another area to do its job. There are neurons that carry the dopamine to the required areas. We refer to this as dopamine pathways. Don't let this picture scare you. All it's showing is movement of dopamine from one area to the next. Where the arrow starts from are areas where dopamine is produced, then it moves to the targeted area where the arrow ends. Each pathway is responsible for a set of dopamine functions, like we previously discussed. So we now have a brief introduction on dopamine. Let's go back to the pathophysiology of psychosis and specifically what the dopamine hypothesis is saying about the pathophysiology. The dopamine hypothesis postulates that psychosis is caused by a hyperactivity of dopamine in the brain. There are three things supporting this. First, scientists noticed that whenever a patient received dopamine agonist, like amphetamines, they experienced psychotic symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized thinking. So pretty much anything that increases the brain's dopamine levels significantly can trigger these symptoms. Second, when we give psychotic patients drugs that reduce dopamine levels or activity, we see a significant improvement in their symptoms. Lastly, brain imaging studies have shown that patients with schizophrenia have an increased density of dopamine receptors in certain areas of the brain. The dopamine hypothesis has proven so powerful that researchers over the years thought dopamine was the only culprit. As it turns out, however, there is much more to psychosis than just dopamine. Now, neurotransmitters like glutamate, serotonin, and GABA have been found to play a role in the pathophysiology of psychosis. I'm not going into details with these. This video is just a background on antipsychotics and how they came about. The next video will discuss the first generation antipsychotics. And then the following will be the second generation. And that will be all, folks. I hope you learned a thing or two. If you did, then please show your support by liking, subscribing if you haven't already, and leaving comments down below. Thank you for watching this video, and take care.